So I, I kind of like to start with just kind of my view of the John Muir Trail. So I want you to switch to the slide, the first of the slides, Carol. So I, you know, I, the JMT is a great iconic trail. It's social, it's, it's pleasant, it's beautiful. On the other hand, um, from the very first guidebook on until I think today, I think many of us think that the trail is kind of better used to give yourself access to other places. I think the idea of doing the iconic trail and then, you know, getting to a trail junction and heading right or heading left uh, just makes for a great hike. You get some of the kind of the, the social hike of seeing other people who you will like and value and share information with but you'll also get some solitude. Uh, and many of those little side trails lead to absolutely wonderful places. Uh, the guidebooks define those. Uh, the existing uh, Pete Starr guide called, it's uh, Sierra Club guide, guide to the John Muir Trail and the High Sierra region. And he has just about all the side trips in there. Elizabeth Wink's new edition of Sierra South uh, also can be, have detailed information about the hikes. Uh, so I, I, I really think a lot of us, I mean, a lot of people do do the hike repetitively, but a lot of us who have hiked it often now think of it more as an access route uh, to the east-west trails or the loops or, you know, things like that. Uh, why don't you do the next uh, slide, Carol? Um, oops, <laughs> there we go. Uh, so, I wanted to talk first about kind of water, kind of GI distress issues, uh, water treatment and kind of how to do sanitation. Uh, Robert Derlett, uh, who's the last listed author on this, had been the leading investigator for years and years and years uh, on Sierra, on water quality in Sierra. And so I called him at one point. He was actually, oddly enough, running for Congress at the time I talked to him. So it's a little bit of a Brush conversation, but he uh, he mostly doesn't treat, um, and he's learned that kind of to distinguish between likely clean water sources, things that are coming down on the side trail, where you know there are no people or pack animals uh, up watershed from you, will tend to be good water, and the top surface of lakes tends to be pretty good water. On the other hand. I think sometimes it's a good idea to um, selectively treat water. So if you'll close this out, Carol, thank you. Um, I asked her to close it out in part because my notes are on the screen. So I can't see my notes if she's got the slides up there. Um, I, I, one of the reasons, I, I, I've been very frustrated with me various mechanical devices for water treatment, water filtration. I had one year where I had two, uh, ceramic filters bust on me. One of them was my fault, the other one wasn't. Um, and on the survey, I asked questions about gear failures and basically kind of anything mechanical can fail. So I think you, if you haven't yet, I think you should try some of the chemical treatments. Uh, my, if, if you kind of are my age, you probably did iodine for a while and that was just God awful. Um, and the current water treatments are much better. There's maybe some taste, but basically it's chlorine dioxide, uh, which you're creating with most of these, and that's used to treat a bunch of municipal water supplies. Uh, what, what I tend to do is I tend to buy the two ounce bottles of Aquamere. They also come in one ounce bottles, which are square. And I think the best solution, uh, the, the, the annoying thing about Aquamere is there are package directions suggest that you, you, you drop some drops in a little cup and you wait five minutes and then you pour it in the water and you wait 15 minutes and that's damned annoying. Uh, so I just get appropriately sized bottles from Whitesmith. I make one blue, one red, and I pre-mix them uh, in a bottle that's purple. And my experience has been, and from what I can tell, I'm doing a little bit of research on on chlorine treatments, as long as they're opaque bottles, uh, the mixture is gonna be pretty steady. It's gonna be pretty good for multiple days. I don't, 
I mean, I, I, I might well, after three days, decide to make a new mixture. But my suspicion is, judging from the color and the smell, well, it's probably chemically stable well beyond that. I also find it very useful, rather than counting drops, if you can get yourself a little one cc syringe, uh, when you move parts A and parts B from those six cc bottles into the premix bottle, it's easier to do. And these are also kind of easier to fill up, uh, um, you know, your water bottle, seven tenths of this is enough for a liter, even if you only have 15 minutes to treat it. And if it's gonna sit around for an hour, uh, you can use a good deal less than that because the, it's both the concentration and the time uh, which uh, gives you water treatment. Um, these, by the way, these three little bottles uh, will treat 25 liters of water. And since that, you know, for a typical, that's, that's quite, quite a lot of water, particularly if on some of your water, or your cooking water, you're not treating it. But you can also, from Lightsmith, which supplied those bottles, you can get bigger bottles if you want. You get basically any size opaque bottle that you want with any size little color. Um, one of the things that a lot of us suspect, um, a lot of us hikers, uh, some of the scientists, although it's not 100% clear, is that the, the GI distress on the trail is probably caused more by hand sanitation problems than it is by water treatment. Water quality is pretty good. Uh, most people are treating. Uh, there isn't, a, on the surveys, there isn't a lot of diarrhea, but there's some. And I think where your problems are coming from are basically from failures of hand sanitation in groups. You're not gonna infect yourself, uh, but your hiking companions, anybody you share food with, um, people don't clean their hands terribly well on the trail. Uh, I will never shake anybody's hand on the trail. I, I've been doing fist bumps way before COVID. Uh, so I think that you should be extremely cautious for that. What has worked really well for me um, for both hand sanitation and for um, kind of toileting is these little Purell wipes. Um, you can buy them a hundred at a time. If they dry out, you can add a little alcohol to them. You can repackage them pretty easily. Uh, this is a packet of 25 of them, which is enough for me for a 10 day trip easily. I find that I use um, one, maybe two of them uh, at a time because they're so sturdy that you can use them kind of unfold and then fold them once, fold them twice, fold them three times. I also bring a little, a few other, so it, when I'm done with the hand sanitizing on um, toileting one, I just let it dry out um, for my toileting uh, following. They, this, you want to try this at time at home? I mean, that doesn't irritate me. Uh, I don't know that I've heard of people it irritates, but you know, do your own experimentation. I also find it's kind of useful to have kind of some other softer wipes, um, tux pads if you dry them out, makeup remover, um, various kinds of products that are designed to be cleaning. Once you dry them out, because you don't usually need what they're soaked with, they become quite light and, and quite useful. In terms of a kind of what you do with the wipes once they've been used, uh, is there are lots of grocery store products that are opaque and smell resistant because you know grocery store people don't want the aisle to smell like cocoa. So these things are opaque and odor resistant. You can go to Amazon, you can buy Mylar uh, bags. Um, somebody sent me a bunch of these, they're, they're kind of cool, uh, but quite frankly, these work just fine. And uh, in terms of putting the entire package together, kind of a cranberry or a prune container, again, is, you know, smell resistant. Um, it, it closes sturdily. It's long lasting. They work quite well. Could you go back to the slides, Carol, for me? This is another one more slide down. Uh, the other mistake that I see people making, uh, the old kind of trowel on the left has 
has become kind of passe. I don't know how many people still carry those around, but we're still using the new trowels, the Deuce of Spades trowels, probably the choice of most people, like it was the old trowel. We're treating it as if it has a handle and a scoop. Whereas in fact, the, the Deuce of Spades is designed to be reversed. I've seen people put tape around uh, the, what they think of as the handle end uh, to protect their hands, but it just reverses. You just kind of use the narrow, you use the scoop as the handle and the narrow end kind of as the pick, break up the soil and flip it around the other way and use the scoop. And you'll find those things work pretty well that way. Thank you, Carol. Um, actually, we can go back to the slide, uh, slide uh, slides again, Carol, sorry. I kind of became, um, I suppose, self-appointed research librarian for the, originally for the Yahoo group. And so I spent a lot of time, go one slide down if you would. Um, I, I, I did a lot of research for, for people. I tried to see if we could go beyond statements of opinion to see where there was data. And often the most relevant data was coming from, very, from, the, from the Army, from NATO, from the Israel, Israeli Armed Forces, Italian Armed Forces, even though some of it. And if there is a single chart that I think is most informative to us, it's this one. Uh, it's an, an Army publication with my annotations. And, and basically what it tells you is that the slope of that line is worth paying attention to. When we're training, we tend to work at relatively high levels of energy. This one happens to be measured by a percentage of a person's maximum oxygen consumption, but you can do the same thing with absolute measures rather than relative measures. And what you find is you, you train in the zone where you, doing high levels of effort. And you kind of get used to hiking that way because you train, get onto the trail. And if you walk at anywhere near the pace you've been training at, you're gonna, you're gonna flag pretty quickly, uh, particularly if you're not 25 years old. Uh, I find on the survey there's a kind of a big number of people who are 20 something and 30 something and then not so many people in their 40s, and then a lot of people return to the trail when they're in their 50s. Uh, and for us in particular, uh, we really have to pay attention to this. At the rates of walking that we want to do, relatively small um, changes in how hard you are working pay off in relatively large changes in how long you can walk before you kind of flag, flag and lose all your energy. Um, Colin Fletcher was probably the first guy I listened to uh, in terms of, um, he, he did a Thousand Mile Summer, which was kind of the first well-known hike that went from Mexico to Oregon. Uh, he did Man Who Walks Through Time, which was a walk the length of the Grand Canyon. He did Complete Walker through several editions. And I can't find his quote anymore, but I, I remember it really well. He said the most common mistake that hikers make is trying to hike too fast. And I couldn't agree with that more. And while you can kind of, you can help your effort by a lightning pack weight, but your effort is basically dependent on your entire weight, your body weight and your food weight and your water weight and your pack weight. So you're making fairly small changes, a five pound change in your base weight does not make a huge difference in the energy it takes because it's the entire mass uh, that is gonna generate how hard you are working. You might not like every pack because it's uncomfortable, but in terms of energy, um, you're better off moderating your speed. And the research tends to show that people kind of naturally, uh, when they have to moderate their speed, particularly uphill, they, they shorten their stride length. That works better than kind of shortening the frequency of your strides. Um, and you should just go with it. Uh, next slide, please, Carol. I think sometimes people feel unenergetic when they're walking slowly, but most of us walk pretty damn slowly on the trail. On the surveys, I ask about miles per day and I also ask when people start and when they end and how many breaks they take. 
And the average miles per hour on the survey is about a little over one and a half miles an hour. Uh, and so if you don't know your own speed yet, and sooner or later you will, I don't expect it to be anything like what you think of as normal in town. You just have to kind of consciously go with slowing down. Uh, you can take advantage of the grade on the JMT. The JMT is a really well graded trail. It's a design grade is 10% that was designed originally to make pack animals more efficient, but it's also a pretty efficient way for people to hike. Uh, and if, if you want to, so that, that means 10% grade means basically over a mile, you're gonna gain a little bit over 500 feet. That's a 10% grade. Uh, if you want to kind of visualize it, think of it as a, a four foot, four inch step up and a 40 inch uh, step forward. You don't see steps like that very often, but that's basically the kind of grade you're talking about. Um, if, you're, if you're planning your hike, I find it more, I, the, the Army recommends to its planners that they assume that a 10% grade uphill will take twice as long as a flat uh, on, on with the other conditions being the same. So basically, if you're kind of thinking things out, you should assume that you're probably, if you're kind of an average hiker, you're going to go maybe a little over a mile an hour on the uphills and probably two miles an hour pretty easily on the downhills and flats. Um, you can kind of convert that because the JMT tends to be long uphills and long downhills. I find it actually easier to pay attention to elevation. Uh, that I'm, I, I've learned kind of in an hour how much I can, I can go uphill. And for me, it's, a, it's around 500 feet an hour, um, including a maybe a 10 minute stop, maybe not. As I get older, it's kind of getting shorter. Um, but if you, if you have some kind of altimeter that's handy, you can really kind of pace yourself well with it. Um, you used to be able to get these, and if you go back to me just for a second, Carol, uh, you can get a Casio watch uh, for, I think they're around 35 bucks. Um, maybe it was 50. Uh, the Santa watches used to be great, but they've gotten extraordinarily expensive. And it'll give you a functional altimeter. There's also other kinds of barometric altimeters that work well. The watch is kind of better than your phone because you you know you don't have to power it down, power it up all the time to save your batteries. Um, so I would suggest that you kind of learn what is the pace at which you hike comfortably uphill. And just using elevation for me works fine. There are kind of complicated formulas of mileage and elevation. But I think you'll find that you're because the JMT is, and many of the Sierra Trails are so evenly graded because they were kind of designed for pack animals, um, you will find that just paying attention to your elevation change will, will probably do it. Um, uh, Carol, back to the slides if you would. And um, this is a kind of a Boy Scout publication that I think is, gives me a point to make in elevation. A, a point uh, that I think is important. This is something I learned from Ned Tibbetts actually when I did one of his training trips and viewed some of his video, early videos. Um, because that time to exhaustion is fairly sensitive to making it easier, you can go a surprisingly amount longer without being exhausted if you can make relatively small changes in how much energy you use. And one of the ways to do that is just to try to have your foot be as flat as possible. Along the trail, you can sometimes use the rocks along the side. You can use little steps. You can use just a random rock. You can use a, a tree root. If you can keep the foot flat, as the left foot is in number two, as opposed to toe up, like the foot is in, right foot is in number three, it's just more efficient because you're using your quads uh, to push up rather than involving them, the less efficient muscles of your lower leg. The other thing you can do, and I, I think this Boy Scout publication was doing this to illustrate the Mountaineer's rest stop step, which was I think the first thing, first training class I took in Yosemite National Park in 1969 or 70, 
taught me about the Mountaineer's Rest app. Um, it can be useful. It basically, it means you lock your knee at the end of every, every step and just kind of give yourself a little bit of muscle relaxation. Doesn't take long. Um, so in kind of illustration two and illustration four where that little blue line is, uh, that's kind of the suggestion of how to lock your knee. Don't overdo it. I mean, if you try to do it all the time, uh, you're gonna, not necessarily gonna be good for your knees. So Carol, if you, uh, thank you, Carol, pop back to me if you would. Um, I'd like to talk about trekking poles a bit because I think trekking poles, I was a late adopter of trekking poles. Um, almost everybody on my survey now uses them. Almost every PCT hiker I see uses them. I think that I, I ask people about gear on the survey and it's like 95% of people are using trekking poles. I was kind of a late adopter, uh, but I think if there was one thing that really helped my hiking, it was a trekking pole. Um, on the other hand, I think the second biggest um, improvement uh, to my hiking technique was changing how they are ordinarily used. And I think what you, you have to realize is that for almost all of your mileage, uh, you're mostly using them just to be sure-footed. You're trying to kind of get in the, in, the, in the situation where you feel enough confidence in your footing uh, that your eyes aren't down on the trail, they're up on the scenery. Um, and the sure-footedness uh, does not require the normal pole length. Uh, I think the standard length of pole, which the kind of a classic is, make it as, as long as you can hold it here, uh, is just an unnecessary waste of energy. On a downhill, you might want them long. Um, you might want to save the shock on your knees. You certainly want them long when you're crossing your screen. But on most of your mileage, on the 10% uphills, on the 10% downhills, they can be quite short. And, and I'm going to show you some slides that I, I think kind of indicate why that is true. So Carol, if you could go back. Um, I, I kind of, one, one up please. Uh, I kind of did a bunch of research on trekking poles uh, as prior to when I was kind of moderating the Yahoo group and we were talking about it. And that kind of that, the, the research on trekking poles is generally quite positive. The results for all sorts of people are good but they have a hidden downside. They increase the amount of work. And unfortunately, you don't notice it. Um, it, is, it becomes so natural after a while. You're kind of using the poles like you use ski poles. And um, you're noticing that you need to lengthen them up when you're going downhill, but you don't realize when you're starting to go uphill, you can shorten them. Um, and, and you're going to have... I think a significant increase, probably in the range of 10%, which is a, a mile a day or so, uh, if you're using poles the ordinary way. And so these are three of the studies. The title on the left shows it all. The one on the right is a similar doctoral thesis. And go down one, Carol. Um, one of the things that happened when I you know, did the initial research is it was clear that the the exercise physiologists were quite excited about this. They were thinking about trekking poles as a way of making rehab programs more efficient. They, they wanted people to use more energy uh, without recognizing they were use, using more energy. For us, that's not good news. Uh, for us, we, you know, it's, it's a hidden energy cost that you will not notice. And, Kind of the next slide, I think, will be kind of the start of the discussion of why that's true. And I think you have to go through to that Wikipedia page. There's a good Wikipedia. Um, I think you have to, yeah, there's a, a good Wikipedia article uh, and reasonably good citations that you can follow up and read about why the normal human arm swing has evolved the way it is. And basically, in a normal walk, your, your arms are kind of acting like a pendulum. Uh, with very little energy, they're kind of counteracting the torque of your leg movement. So you're, you know, you're, as you know, your 
uh, right hand is going out with your left uh, leg. And as you walk faster or slower, the, the magnitude of that swing very naturally changes. And they found that when people um, either hold their hands at their side or they try to walk the opposite way, right hand with right leg, there are significant increases in the amount of, of energy used. So in addition to just simply the additional weight of lifting the pole, and the, it's not so much the pole, it's your forearm. Your forearm is about six pounds. Uh, constantly lifting and lowering those things is not insignificant. But probably this loss of the natural arm swing is, is the bigger explanation of why there's this hidden energy cost uh, to the trekking pole. So next slide, if you will. But yeah, you have to go back, I think. Yeah, next, that one. Um, you just can't do a normal arm swing with the typical poles. Um, you're going to, you'll notice that on, on this kind of standard illustration, uh, his, his right hand is going out with his right foot and his left foot is going, or you can get to the point where you take two or three strides uh, with one set of poles. If you get to the point where your poles are short enough to keep that natural arm swing, it becomes reasonably effortless. Um, go down one side for me if you will, Carol. And, and you kind of see this on the trail all the time, that people's uh, poles are not matching their strides. Uh, they're, you can, if you kind of look for Google images of trekking poles, you'll see these kinds of things. A uh, guy in the big picture, it's got his left pole with his left foot. The guy on the right is kind of walking through his poles, so he's not really using the arm poles consistently. Uh, the lady there on the lower left is not, I mean, she's got an awful path, but she's also not untypical of people who decide they want a fixed length pole. And so on most of the trail, their poles are way too long because they've chosen a fixed length pole that's good enough to go downhill with. Uh, Carol, if you could uh, close that out. Uh, because of that, um, I choose really short poles. Um, literally, my pole can kind of go, whoops, let's put this camera down a little bit. Carol told me I have to do this. I can literally put my standard length pole for a you know, a, a slight upgrade or flat uh, to the point where it fits between my legs. Downhill, I'm fine with it, maybe five centimeters longer. It doesn't take much of a change. Um, the changes, once you have a short pole, the changes are pretty easy to make. If you have one of these flip locks, uh, you get to the point where you can make them as you're walking. And the kind of the, the idea basically is to end up kind of just kind of walking naturally. Of these things. And it's, a, it's it's surprisingly hard to do at first because you're used to doing it differently. So I kind of suggest to people they try it with one pole at a time. So you're kind of matching your right hand to your left foot and just kind of walking. And then when that feels natural, um, pick it up to uh, two poles. And I, I think you will find it a less effortful way of hiking. You can also get two-part kid poles uh, because they're short enough. Uh, sometimes people think they're going to be weak, but in fact, the, the things that are going to fail on a pole are the thin section, and the thin section on both of these poles is the same because the same old clamp will hold them both. And the other thing that's going to fail is the joint. And on the kid's pole, you have one joint as opposed to two joints. Uh, so it it I, I, it is not. I, I can't prove it, but everything about the logic of how poles fail suggests to me that the kids' poles are, if anything, safer uh, than the adult poles uh, because of the lack of the, of the double uh, failure point of the two locks. Let me see. This is probably the only suggestion that I'll make today that I would urge you to give it a try, even though you think everything is working for you. I mean, because of that phenomenon that we don't notice the additional uh, exertion of the trekking pole, it's a kind of a hidden energy suck. And I, I think many people who will try it 
if they don't mind looking a little odd in the trail and having people look at them a little crossways, um, I think you'll find it works really quite well. Uh, I'd like to turn a little bit to uh, the food. Uh, we don't, we're about halfway through the time, so I think we're on schedule. Um, on the survey, um, 90 plus people lose weight, 90% plus of the people lose weight. Uh, the average, uh, or I can't remember if it's median or mean weight loss amongst people who lose weight is seven ounces a day. That's an energy shortfall of somewhere in excess of a thousand calories. Uh, so they are kind of trying to walk without enough fuel. And it, it can be tempting. You kind of think of your hike as your diet, uh, but you're much better off, I think, doing the diet before you hike, because if you can kind of succeed in, in walking that 175 rather than 185, uh, that's probably just as good as taking 10 pounds off to the base weight. Um, and then give yourself enough food um, when you hike. The calories are what we need to worry about the most. I mean, you people worry about other stuff like protein, but calories are really driving what makes food work on the trail. And if you don't know your own calorie consumption, um, I would suggest if you, you Google a, a BMR, basal meta metabolic rate calculator, uh, that will adjust for your weight, your height, and your gender. And it will give you what you use at rest. And you basically kind of double it, uh, surprisingly enough. I mean, we think all the work is the walking, but actually maintaining our bodies is actually the biggest use of our energy. Uh, so roughly speaking, you double the BMR to figure out how many calories you need. If you're going really big miles, uh, maybe you do a little bit more. If you're blazing along, maybe a little bit less. But, but for most people, I think, if you bring enough calories to be twice your base metabolic rate, you'll maybe lose a little weight, but not so much that you'll kind of start lacking energy. Um, the best way though is to count calories on a hike, count how many you, you, know, you don't eat and figure out how many days you wait and how much weight you lost. And if your weight's stable, I mean, you kind of, you kind of lose three, four pounds and kind of um, water weight and kind of the basic past energy molecules. But beyond that, um, your goal, I think, is to be fairly weight stable on a trail. I think you, you want to get to the point of, of knowing how many calories cause you to be weight stable or close to it on trail. And, and you'll learn what yours is. I've learned that mine is 3,000, I think do 2,400 calories in the early part of our, uh, a hike at my age and my speed. Um, but it's, I wanna be on a longer hike when kind of the hungries kick in, um, or when I just kind of need more energy, I want 3,000. Uh, but you know, everybody is different. It's not so much that you are different from other people like you. The Army's done some research that suggests that there's not that much variation person to person. Uh, but there certainly is variation on, on height and gender and weight and pack weight and stuff like that. Um, so your, your food problem kind of comes down to, to three solutions, three problems that you have to say at the same time. You've got to make sure that you can carry the weight and, and you want to see that you've got calories that are weight efficient. And for that, you basically read the label. You, you can't you can't tell it. Um, can it fit in your bear can? And for this, you actually, when you feel it in your hand, it will tell you, it should actually feel heavy. If you think about the difference between oatmeal and cornmeal or regular rice and minute rice, the difference between those two is calories will be the same, more or less, but the calories per ounce will be the same in either case but the volume will be noticeably different and you will notice it in, in the weight of the material. So don't, don't shy away from something that feels heavy because that really, it's not telling you anything about calories. You gotta read the label for the calories, uh, but the kind of feeling hefty will mean it'll more likely get those calories from the door can. And then the final problem in addition to can carry and can fit is you can't eat it. Um, Lots of people on the survey report inability to eat all the food they bring. 
uh, particularly it turns out on the first half of the hike. Uh, I've had some people report to me that when they get to Muir Trail Ranch, they, they, they kind of don't bother to pack half their food because they've had been, a, you know, foods, you know, kind of hunger suppressed, appetite suppressed in the first 10 days. And then they try to go to Whitney and suddenly the hungry's kick up. Uh, so you, you kind of have to realize um, that your appetite is going to vary, but you can do things that cause you to actually be able to eat it. I, I think some of the standard solutions to the food problems aren't very good. Uh, the back, standard backpacker meals, if you read the calories on the label, uh, they're quite low. Uh, even if you feel I'm going to eat both servings, uh, they're still not terribly high. Um, there's, there's freeze dried, which is ridiculously high volume. You, and it's so high volume, you can't even really think of it usually. Can't fit very many calories in your bear can with freeze dried food. But people do do home dehydration, and for many people that works. But when you kind of cook something at home and then you dehydrate it, when you cook it, you're adding water to it. When you dehydrate it, you replace the water with little air bubbles. And so the volume of home dehydrated uh, stuff tends to be fairly high. So I, 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 I think a lot of the kind of standard solutions to the food problem have a problem. If it works for you, fine. But I, I think if you're interested in adjusting some of your food choices, I think what you need to concentrate is how do you get high cal, how do you get compact, and how do you get tasty? And so I kind of wanted to share some some, some thoughts about that. Um, in, in a lot of ways, um, there, there are some kind of gear suggestions that I've got. Um, if you want to be doing things on trail that you actually cook, it really helps having something that makes it easy to scrub a pot. You don't have to get the pot clean every time, but you have to get it clean enough that it's not going to jump up your next meal. So you can have, I might have a little pesto left over in my cornmeal for breakfast or a little cornmeal left over in my pesto. It doesn't make any difference. A pot scraper will do it just fine. This is called an MSR Alpine pot brush, I think. Um, this one, I don't, you know, I found at one point it's a little lighter, but basically you just want a scraper. And once you have a scraper, then you start being able to give yourself some options to to kind of cook real food on trail, more or less from ingredients. Uh, the other thing that will really help you with cooking is you can get uh, reflectrix, uh, the kind of effect they make um, windshield things out of. You can buy six inch rolls. Uh, you can buy big long rolls. You can share them with your friends. Um, it used to be that there were some stores that, that sell this stuff by the foot, but I, you know, I haven't been able to find them. But it's not that expensive, and it just be in your basement. You've got a lifetime supply of it. I usually use a double uh, layer of reflectrix. You can. It's pretty. There are plenty of, you know, information online of how you do it. You kind of use a basically you wrap around something and you put tape. It's something that creates a base is good. Uh, this will allow you really to. Um, it allows you to steep things. You can kind of bring something up to a simmer, turn off your burner, just let it sit there for 10 minutes. If you have to bring it up to a simmer again, uh, you will find that a very short amount of, of reheat will bring it back to the simmer and it will simmer some more. Um, that gives you some options of food that you don't have if you're just kind of reheating things in bags or using backpacker meals. And I would also suggest to you that you think of having your eating utensil in a cozy. Um, plenty jars are, are a great little shape. Um, okay. Yeah. Could you bring me that uh, cooler from the freezer? Yeah. Uh, plenty jars are the right shape, but unfortunately, they deform when you pour boiling water into them. Same thing will happen with the peanut butter jar. Uh, the things that work in terms of, you know, either rehydrating something or just kind of keeping it warm. Uh, I tend to cook really big meals. I can't eat them all uh, before they get cold. 
and uh, kind of a jar like this and a cozy like this will keep that warm. I can cook kind of a double serving of cornmeal and breakfast for breakfast and put this in, kind of seal it up, put a top on it and eat it an hour later and it's still nice and warm. Uh, the jars you want are kind of polypropylene, works really well. Uh, they say recycle number five on the bottom or PP on the bottom. They handle heat. Uh, they can get brittle in extreme cold. You have to be a little careful for them for winter hiking, uh, but they work you know, really quite well. They're mostly not, food products tend not to be sold in them, but they're grocery store products. Tucks, for example, are served in a, it's sold in a 12 ounce version of this. But I really suggest US plastic. Uh, the shipping costs of US plastic are high. But if you look for straight sided polypropylene jars, which I'll put in the links later on, uh, you can get just about any size you want. And you can make a cozy for any jar you decide to bring. And it, you know, basically, this is my dish. Uh, this is my food storage where I can only eat half of my food. This might be food rehydrating, although I usually just rehydrate in my pot. Uh, it's just an extremely useful little piece of gear. The reflectrix weighs close to nothing, and the jar is not too bad. I think the other packaging problem that I didn't know about until quite recently, I think I learned this from somebody on the ladies of the JMT, is uh, breast milk storage bags. Uh, breast milk is very precious. People do not want to waste it. So it is sold in sterile and resealable and very sturdy um, containers. And it gives you the ability to carry things. There's also one that has a kind that you can get with a little cap. So if you want to do olive oil, something you're opening and closing repeatedly, uh, you can get the kind of cap. The kind that the Lanaso ones uh, will be in your Walgreens probably. If you go online, you can get a eight ounce version. So it's a little bit bigger. That's the same basic design. Um, and you end up being able to carry things. Sorry, let me open this. You end up being able to carry things that would be otherwise kind of hard to package. Um, this is double smoked bacon, which has basically been cooked in bacon fat or lard. And I, I've taken this and I've put it in a jar and I carry it in these breast milk bags. Um, I put it down in my basement for six months. That's fine. And the reason why is you kind of have to start with a really traditionally cured uh, salt pork product done the kind of the old fashioned way. This is a kind of a bacon that's double smoked. Uh, you cook it in its own fat or in some lard until you kind of drive off most of the moisture. You put it in the, in the sterile bag. Uh, you store it in your freezer until you leave and it will last you for the trip. And you can kind of add it, you know, if you really want to stick with backpacker meals, uh, you can add ghee, which is dehydrated butter, uh, which also can go in these things. Uh, you can add that to basically anything that's sweet. You can add it to breakfast mix. And you're adding with fats about 250 calories, up to 250 calories an ounce. And many of these things are pretty close to 250 calories an ounce, as opposed to the most you're going to get out of carbohydrates uh, or proteins, which is about 109 even fully dehydrated, even pure sugar, 109 calories an ounce is the highest you're going to get. Um, so the, the packaging options kind of give you more cooking options. Uh, the polypropylene jars that I showed you from US Plastic also will do the trick if you don't want to use the breast milk bag. These pack a little bit more efficiently uh, because once they're not in my freezer anymore, they're soft and I can form them around other things. Yeah, this is an example, I think, of the one kind of one that I put in my basement for for six months. It was it was Speck, which is a kind of a traditionally cured German ham product. I cooked it in it basically in lard, sealed it up. And because I had an injury in 2017, I had some left over. So I just left it down in the basement. Literally six months later, I opened it up. It's fine. And the reason it's fine 
is basically it's it's got all the traditional curing that traditional meat products, smoked meat products have, cured meat products have, and it's dried out when you cook it, and it's submerged in fat. And fat is naturally very stable on the trail. Uh, if you actually go into a your grocery store at Christmas time, it may be lard there that people use for pie crusts. It doesn't need to be refrigerated. We just put it all on the shelf uh, because pure fats are extremely stable. And in even the breast milk bags or something like this, you fill them when they're reasonably warm. Uh, so they're sterile in there. Uh, you don't have to worry about anything happening until you open it. And even once you open it, uh, my experience has been, you know, I'll try to eat it within four or five days, but I, I don't know that I have to. I haven't been able to tell any deterioration at all. Uh, your other kind of choices are kind of, uh, let's see, I'm not sure. Uh, I think the other thing is, you know, you really, if you, if you kind of start thinking about cooking from ingredients, you kind of start with the idea of what kind of fats and oils can I use? Uh, ghee, olive oil, um, you know, pork fat products, bacon fat. Those are kind of going to be the major ones, but you can you can get things. You can get beef tallow uh, sometimes. You can just kind of find fat products that work for you and then figure out what you add them to. Um, the other option is products that already have uh, quite a bit of fat. The uh, Coast Guard had to deal with the problem of how do we have lifeboat rations? How do we get them kind of high calorie uh, and so they've designed specifications for emergency rations that are surprisingly good. Uh, they're, you know, the heft of this uh, will suggest to you that it's quite compact, which it is. There's 2,400 calories in this, uh, which for some people would be a full day's worth of calories. Uh, they're so quite tasty. They come in individual little wrapped packages inside that bigger package. They are crumbly. Uh, they look like this when you open them up. And they taste kind of like uh, shortbread, basically. Uh, they're a little dry, but as you chew them, maybe you can take some water with them. Or you actually just let the saliva come up and it will make them quite good. I've also actually kind of made a little frosting out of ghee and some kind of sugar product. This, this bag, once when it was full, was a mixture of, of ghee and olive oil. And I just kind of made a frosting and, and spread it on the top. And you're getting like close to 140 calories an ounce uh, with kind of stuff because the Coast Guard is basically kind of trying to save this, solve the same problem that we're trying to solve. Long lasting, high calorie, compact. I find also, but these, these things do kind of want to tend to crumble. Uh, so if you take a, you can kind of reseal these packages with a little duct tape, or in this case, a 10 mil pipe wrap, uh, and you kind of keep them all together. Once you get one of the little things out in order to keep it from crumbling, you just kind of put it in a short pocket until you eat it. The other kind of, uh, Already uh, high calorie products are nuts. Macadamia and pine nuts are the highest calories per ounce. Um, if you get these chopped macadamia nuts, they're, they're more compact to pack. Uh, I add them, I just eat them raw. I put them in my morning cereal. Uh, they're extremely efficient. Traditional cheeses. Um, this was kind of how people solved the problem of you're going to send your son up uh, into the meadow for you know, three months over the summer in order to kind of herd the sheep. And so you developed hard cheeses that worked. Um, it was kind of one product. You made a bunch of it at a time. You let it dry out. It's extremely stable. Uh, you know, this is Pecorino, um, Parmesan Reggiano uh, also works really well. G-Tost works really well. And what you're really looking for is the kind of cheese that would have pre-existed uh, refrigeration. So you're looking for traditional cheeses 
because they tend to be very high calorie, very low moisture because they wanted them to be low moisture in order to survive. Um, you can eat them straight. You can uh, grate them. You can kind of saute them, these little microplane graters. You don't need to bring the handle, just bring this little thing. And you can kind of grate cheese into your pasta or whatever you want to do. It's cheese is like just like a really good ingredient. Um, hey, John, this is your five minute warning. Okay. Uh, the other thing that really works well is nut butters work really well. Uh, peanut macadamia. Can't, I mean, don't overdo it, uh, but they work well in most breast milk battles. Nido works really well, which is a whole food, um, excuse me, a whole milk product, with a little bit of soy in it. Uh, it's stocked at, at least in my area, at Targets and Walgreens. It may also be in grocery stores that have a sizable Hispanic population nearby because it apparently is more popular as a baby food formula um, in Hispanic countries. You can also figure out many things that you can easily add fats to. Cornmeal is the same calories per ounce as oatmeal, but it's half the volume. You can also call it polenta. You can call it yellow grits. It makes a pretty good breakfast uh, with some chopped mangoes um, and some ghee and a little bit of maple syrup or maple sugar. It's really tasty. Uh, hummus, dried hummus. Works really well as something that absorbs a lot of olive oil. You don't follow the package directions. You, you kind of figure out how to do it at home and you add as much tahini as you can, which is sesame paste and olive oil. You want to kind of minimize the hummus and maximize the oil ingredients, some sun-dried tomatoes, make it really tasty. You can also, uh, tabbouleh kind of works the same way. It's kind of bulgur and, and some spices, parsley mostly. Uh, this Sadaf brand shows up sometimes. Casbah is probably even more common. Some bulk stores may have it in bulk for you. Your other, I think, really helpful products are several Trader Joe's products. Um, they have various kinds of stuffed um, pastas, tortellini, little raviolis. They're compact. A pasta isn't going to work. I mean, spaghetti is not going to work because in a small pot it'll stick together, but these things work pretty well. You can add cheese to it, add olive oil to it. I add pesto to it. I make homemade pesto and put it in one of those breast milk bags. Um, Trader Joe's has a great product called Harvest Grains Blend, which is basically large grain couscous and other good stuff. And because it's large grain rather than that real small couscous, it kind of tastes very foamy and it also kind of, it absorbs a good deal of fats and oils without getting bad. You just kind of end up adding, a, you know, mostly this, some water, some bacon fat, some bacon, and then you kind of give it some flavor with some kind of dried soup. Taste Adventure is a pretty good brand. I like the curry lentil. I like the black bean. Um, you can also sometimes just get dried, refried pinto beans, and they work pretty well. Um, yeah, that's, oh, uh, let's go to that final slide, and I have one more slide for you. Let me just, for some reason, I'm not seeing it, but let me do something here, Carol. Um, if you are trying to think of your own, there's a shared Google Drive uh, folder that uh, originally was from the Yahoo group. Uh, we, we pared it down. It's well organized on Google Drive. We've been adding things to it for years. And there is a food and nutrition section. And you'll see a subfolder for uh, calories. And there are a bunch of lists in there of ingredients ranked by calorie. So you can kind of look down the list. Um, if you, you want things that are high calorie, if they have water in them, sometimes you can take the water out uh, by just simmering them. Uh, sometimes you can't, depends on the food. Uh, and you can get a lot of things that are quite high calorie and figure out what works for you. You're kind of looking for 
high fat products that are maybe, you know, the pure fats are going to be 250. The kind of relatively high fat foods are going to be maybe 140 calorie per ounce. If it's a pure carbohydrate or protein, you're going to want to add some fats to it probably, but you can choose those in the 100, 100 to 110 calories per ounce category. And these are a very long lists. The original USDA list that was the base of this, I think is 7,500 7, different foods. Uh, so you, you get yourself a lot of choices if you just sort it in the order of calories per ounce. Um, that's probably the end of you know, the stuff I was planning on talking about today. Okay, great. Thank you guys again so much for joining. And thank you, John, so much for giving your time to all of us. Such great information. Well, hopefully somebody's got some idea that will work for them. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye, Kat. Bye, everyone else. Thank mm -hmm. you.